Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo saucy! Zaxby's. You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. The Archaeology Podcast Network is sponsored by Codify, a California benefit corporation. Visit Codify at www.codifi.com. Ancient tools and burials, plants and seeds, Neanderthals. All these things we make no Welcome apology. to the Archaeological Fantasies Podcast, Episode 69. I'm your host, Sarah Head, and I'm joined today with my co-hosts, Ken Fader and Jeb Card. And today we're discussing hairy man petroglyphs. What are these images depicting? Do they actually depict hairy men? Are these hairy men Bigfoot? If so, does this prove that Bigfoot is real? And what can we learn from the misinterpretation of indigenous mythologies? You will see our staple. Get ready to think critically. But we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Archaeological Fantasies podcast. I am your host, Sarah, and I am joined by my co-hosts today, Ken Fader and Jeb Card. Hey, guys, how's it going? It's going great. Good morning to you, Sarah and Jeb. Um, it's it's going fine. And uh, <laughs> talking about what our, our topic is, uh, I uh, we have talked in the past how that at one point there was sort of a, a drinking game if uh, we mentioned cryptozoology on the show, <laughs> you might games. you might be completely blind drunk by the end of the hour. And hopefully you're listening to this at a reasonable time to be yes. doing that drinking game. Because, because it's like nine o'clock where we are. I was gonna say we, we're recording early today. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. we, we made the decision to do cryptozoology this week. But we're doing it. For a reason, we are doing it with an archaeological bend in mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we're going to start with the charmingly named Death of a Pterodactyl yes. Petroglyph. I, I'm yeah. in love with that, actually. I think it's yeah. funny. It, 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 it's, an important, it's an important piece of American theater. Yeah. It is. It's very much. <laughs> Death of a Pterodactyl, yes. Death of a Pterodactyl. Absolutely. Pulitzer Prize winning, excellent. And this, is, and this is by the, – the, who's the article Death of a Pterodactyl by? It is by, uh, I've got it right here, a person whose name I cannot pronounce, Jean-Luc Luc, Le, Le, Paul Le Bond, yeah. Marvin, Rob, Marvin Rao. Yeah, Paul Bond is a really well-known... That's, uh, that's why I noticed it, yeah. yeah. He and writes, we apologize he for butchering yeah. your name. Yeah, I'm, just, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, but the general theme here, because we are, we are archaeologists, is the, is the question, are there, in fact, say, artistic depictions, carving, sculptures... Um, pictographs or petroglyphs of critters that would fit into the category of cryptid, um, either um, animals that normal science does not accept as being real, or or people in, in this case, we're going to talk about North America, depicting animals that at the time they were depicting them, normal science says, oh, they were long extinct. Yeah, that's a pretty um, common part of cryptozoology is, is looking into the, the past, and I think, again, I have reasons right. for that. But no, you routinely will find that archaeology is often held up as one of the big proofs of these. Like, somebody drew it, somebody witnessed right. it, and, and it wasn't somebody, like, lying about it today or a blurry photograph. It's on a cave wall. It's on a right. piece of pottery, and it's very it's – very, movie logic like if you yes. were watching a movie about like the beast of the canyon and look there's a depiction of it and that would be like your first picture of it before it then like started yeah. eating, eating the camp or something yeah and that would be the dramatic reveal would be the 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 uh the archaeologists use it with with pit hill and and flashlights and they're looking at this cave wall and they're seeing normal stuff stuff that they would expect and then the music yeah. swells as they reveal, oh, my God, that looks like a brontosaurus. Or, or, or oh better God. yet, or better yet, they, oh, they're, in their, they're in their library. They're in their, their Victorian library. They would open up a, a big, huge oh, right. book yes. and page through and be like, people have seen these around the world for thousands of years. Yeah. They call them by different names, but right. it, it would it's, be something like that. 
Yeah, it's it's the equivalent in some other paranormal movie. The image would be that of a, a hoofed beast. Oh my God, these are people who have seen the devil. In right. case they're just cryptids. Um, yep. This this there actually is a broader a broader um, um, question here uh, in North America, especially. There are a couple of of um, archaeological artifacts that in theory depict woolly mammoths <clears throat> now that's common in europe it's not common in north america um the, and most recent well there's the holly oak pendant in which which actually has been um radiocarbon dated and the thing is a fake and it's a depiction of a woolly mammoth now people were here when they were woolly mammoths so it is entirely conceivable that they would have depicted them the vera right. beach artifact there's one from in florida yes where again there's a lot of controversy over that, over that i think the guy who found it um actually sold it for a ton of money yeah and th but there that in this in this instance real science has been applied to determining whether or not this could in fact be legit and right well exactly and, yeah go ahead well, well like you said the big difference here i guess to just put it out there is there is a mountain of evidence at places like Meserich, literally a mountain of mammoth bones, <laughs> that humans saw mammoths and interacted with them. Right, right. Whereas, and also that mammoths were real because <coughs> we have bones of them. I have some, we have some in our university. Um, these things, not so much. Right, exactly. In the case of mammoths, when you have, I think it's in Washington State, the Manus site, where you have an actual sto uh, bone spear point embedded in the vertebra yeah. of a mammoth, yeah. it's pretty damn clear that there were mammoths and that people lived at the same yeah. time and then people interacted with them. Well, the, the site of Mezirich in Ukraine is about 14,000 years ago, so it's actually contemporary, almost contemporary with the one you just mentioned in Washington, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where they were not just hunting mammoths, they were building their houses out of right. them. Right, yes. They're yes, literally the bones. bone igloos. They are amazing. Yeah, very, very cool. I but think that so would be kind of neat to live inside of, honestly. <laughs> yes, well, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty goddamn metal is what it is. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. Very, very cool. So anyway, so so in, in the late 1920s, um, somebody – we're, we're, first, we're in Utah. We're in a place called the Raphael Swell which is a gigantic geological dome um, of its sandstone, limestone, and shale that uplifted tens of millions of years ago. Uh, because it's relatively soft rock, there's been substantial erosion, and so you get all these amazing geological features, these deeply incised canyons and sheer cliffs. So it's a really beautiful area, and Native folks lived in the area, and Native folks went into some of these deep canyons, and they did, in fact... Um, draw uh, petroglyphs, they, they incised des um, designs or images in stone, and they painted them. Petroglyphs are incised, pictographs are painted. Um, I have not seen a pictograph. I've seen one nearby that's the, the head of Sinbad. Very, very cool pictographs. Both the Black Dragon and the head of Sinbad are the Barrier Canyon style. That's That name is applied to these elongated, very often they have large eyes, no arms and legs often. Um, the, the head of Sinbad, we have actually mentioned before in, in, um, in a previous podcast, because a photograph of that art is can be found at the International UFO Museum in Roswell, where <laughs> the caption indicates the eyes could be extraterrestrial aliens. Because of course. Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> of course. Now, the Black Dragon, which I hope to get to see, is, is actually a few miles down the road. It's a little bit harder to get to. And in the 19, late 1920s, somebody saw this and said, wow, this is really cool. Um, not much more than that until the 1940s when a gentleman, Mr. Simonson, went there and said, you know, this looks like a dragon. And then hmm. what he did kind of screwed up the discussion for a long time. He took chalk and he outlined the dragon that he thought should be there around very highly weathered pictographs. So in other words, he knew what a dragon should look like. He knew that you couldn't really see that on this pictograph panel, but if he filled in the dots, if he filled in the blanks, oh, now it became clear it was, in fact, a dragon. So this essentially, is... he okay. vandalized the pictograph to well, make it look like what he thought it should have looked like. Well, this <laughs> is reminding me of two other cases. Yeah, one, I was going to say. Ken, Ken, one, the Westford Knight. Oh, my God, yes. 
So where, where, in, could, could you briefly kind of show the, the, what I'm what I'm what I'm comparing here? Yeah, this is this is a a, a, a chunk of rock in Massachusetts, in which there are these glacial striations. They are natural features on the rock. And on top of that, some folks in the early 20th century decided, well, we're going we're gonna to connect some of these lines because maybe there could be a sword and maybe this could be a knight. And so by the time they're done, it looks like a sword and a knight. But it starts off with just natural scratch marks on rock. And this is also typical. I mean, we can make this even, even more broadly, the site known as America Stonehenge or Mystery Hill. Today looks very mysterious, enigmatic. And part of that reason is because the fellow, um, this William Goodwin guy, yep. who bought the site in the late 30s and 90s, early 40s, decided, oh, this is a this was a, a village of Irish Kuldi monks. I'm going to reconstruct it because I know what that should look like by piling rocks on top of one another. Well, of course, now it doesn't look exactly the way it looked because this guy knew what it should look like, and he rebuilt it. Well, this right. is a really common it's... tactic, though, used by especially modernly used by the fringe i mean i see it all the time on television shows because i watch those right. things where they'll take a picture and they'll be like yes if you look at it from this angle and then look and then they will draw a highlighted line around the you know like digitally draw a highlighted line around an image of course. and you know now that that line is there you're going to see whatever image it is that they've drawn out yeah. for you right. so you your eye has no has no ability has nothing yeah. else to focus on but that new image regardless uh, uh, of if it actually looks like that or not yeah i instruct my students so when they when they open up one of von donnegan's books for example yeah say, do hide the caption don't read the caption look at the image look at the rock art or whatever it is what do you think that looks like and if it's devoid of that context provided by von donnegan I don't know. It looks like a guy. And then if you read the caption, it says, oh, no, that's guy, a guy wearing a space suit. They go, oh, I see it. The right. Palenque sarcophagus lid is the perfect example. Exactly. And I think you need medical attention if without any, without any prodding, if you see a spaceman in that, seek medical attention because how does it look like that? But if you read the caption that Von Donnegan provides for that image, that, oh, okay, he's telling you what you should be seeing, and that's what you see. Well, the the one the other one it reminds me of, and I, I cannot remember the name of it, but we can probably probably there's uh, on like sort of the Illinois like the Western Illinois border uh, or is it, yeah I think it's Western. Uh, there's like a rock painting of a monster with like wings, and does this is this ringing a bell, Ken? No, huh? No. Um, I oh god, I can't remember the name of it. Like it's it's on the tip of my tongue. I, I used to be able to know the name of this thing, and it is there was a legitimate pictograph there. There was a legitimate painting, right. <laughs> and I think it's basically something like a local version of the whole water panther concept, like a Cherokee oh, antenna. Oh, okay. Yes. yes yeah. Yes. But in the 1700s, it got initially recorded but then it kept getting redrawn and as sure. it kept getting redrawn by europeans it like looked more and more uh dra yeah. dragon like and demon like and of course now people are really super excited by this thing because of course it's been turned into like what they want it to be of i'm course, gonna see right. if I, exactly. i'm gonna see if i can try to figure out what yeah. the hell this thing is right and in the case of the black dragon the, and that's, in fact, it's called Black Dragon Canyon. The Piazza. The Piazza. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, Black Dragon Canyon got the name because of this this image on this wall, this pictograph. And naturally enough, within very short order, young Earth creationists glommed onto this saying, aha, this isn't just a dragon. It's a pterodactyl. It's a pterosaur. And this shows that human beings were living in Utah at the same time that these presumably extinct animals were alive. So that, so therefore, it can only have been in the last few thousand years. So all of evolutionary history, evolutionary chronology, that's all wrong. The world is, in fact, 10,000 years old. And human beings and dinosaurs and flying reptiles were alive at the same time. And here's an example of people... Uh, an eyewitness account being translated into a work of art. And if you look up Black Dragon Pictograph, you will find creationist sites extolling this as this is the kind of evidence that archaeologists and paleontologists and paleoanthropologists simply cannot respond to. I believe so, that is in the Creation Museum's dragon section. Keep talking. I'm going to see in, in my photos if yeah. it is. I, I well, believe it is. Of course it is. It is. <laughs> That's, but so, 
and I think it, I think that's a general a general theme among creationists is that all stories or legends of dragons of flying reptiles are in fact stories uh, that reflect human eyewitness human inter- encounters with um, human eye- eyewitness accounts of um, animals that were alive during the Jurassic but in fact were alive only ten to six six to ten thousand years ago. The thing is, archaeologists, folks who actually study rock art, have visited Black Dragon and for years said, we don't see what this guy, if you eliminate, if you ignore the chalk mark, there's nothing there. There are a series of images. We can't quite make them out because they're very, they've been, been, become very attenuated. They're very dull. They're very highly weathered. Then the cool thing is, well, we now have technologies for making ancient rock art pop. And it's some of it's pretty simple. Well, X-ray fluorescence, for example, mm-hmm. and there's a there's a software. There's a piece of software that's called D Stretch, and what D Stretch does, I, I've got, I have it. It's really incredibly cool because what it does, it's it's essentially a series of films. If you take a photograph of a rock art panel, in which especially pictographs, in which you can't make, you see there's something there, but the image itself is very is very dull. It's become very weathered. What this does is it seeks out the individual colors, and you can set different filters on it. And it doesn't add anything. It doesn't put anything that's not already there into the image. It merely accentuates what has na- what has today is very highly weathered. And in this article, Death of the T- per- Pterodactyl, which appeared in Antiquity, Antiquity is the preeminent um, prehistory magazine journal in the UK. So this is, it's the equivalent of American Antiquity here in the US. So this yeah, it's is a- founded by OGS Crawford. Yeah, this, so this is a very high level journal. It's interesting. I find it kind of interesting that, that it took a British journal to deal with a, a bunch of bullshit about a piece of rock art in Utah, but that's another issue. But what these guys did was they simply went there and they they used X, X-ray, X-ray fluorescence and this de-stretch software to, to make the image, to freshen the image essentially. Again, it doesn't add anything that's not there. It merely takes the color, and whether it's yellow or green or reds or oranges or blacks, and it makes that pop. And when you look at it, there is in fact no pterodactyl. <laughs> There's no flying uh, animal at all. There are five separate images, and it's really striking. And what we'll do is we can – that article is now um, freely available, and uh, let's definitely put a link to that article. And you can see the the, um, the, the actual manipulated photograph, the photograph in which the, the, the dull colors have been accentuated and you pop, and you very clearly see – there are two, in what used to be a pterodactyl, it's abundantly clear there are two bighorn sheep, there are two anthropomorphs, there are two human beings. And the bizarre thing is the mouth of the pterodactyl is actually two arms of a person yeah, thrust right. out, and there is a horned snake. Horned snakes are very, very common in the rock art in the Southwest. So these are snake who have who have antlers on them um and i guess there are some species that have little bumps on the top yes. of their heads yes there yeah. are there so, are horned serpents so, yeah so so obviously those but there's five entirely separate images there's nothing connecting them on this rock art panel and that's that's an excellent you know if you're going to say okay there's a pterodactyl here if we can apply modern technology to to improve the image so that we can see what's really there and this is a perfect application of that. There's no pterodactyl. There's there's no flying serpent. There are five separate images, and those those images individually are found all throughout um, rock yeah. art in the Southwest, and especially in Barrier Canyon rock art. Yeah, I am uh, one. It is in the Creation Museum. I'm looking at uh, a panel from their dragon exhibit that opens uh-huh. like before before you even pay. Uh, there's this big long. It's actually my favorite part because it was kind of. It wasn't just a sermon. Like large chunks of it are very sermony, whereas this is basically right. like cryptozoological stuff. Dragon depictions around the world, and in there, there's a picture of it, and then a beardy guy looking at it. I don't know why that's in there. Um, does this native? It's like, it's like a, it's, they have a picture of it, and then they have a second picture underneath it of a beardy guy with a hat looking at it, with no labels who that is. So it's just like <laughs> it's Moses. Know, but 
Does uh, this, no, 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 no. Like a modern native, like a modern, not native, modern, modern beardy guy. Oh, but okay. uh, the reason I said native was the caption is, does this native American pictograph in Utah depict a pterosaur? And it's right next to a moche vessel, the Narmer palette and the, um, the top prom right. quote unquote stegosaurus. Uh, the second thing, I'm actually not surprised that Antiquity was the ones that published it. Antiquity is very old. It is very highly respected. It right. is a scientific journal, but from its beginning, part of its mission was also, if you read their stuff, it is not necessarily crazy technical and for specialists all only. It had <laughs> right. always was also meant to communicate to the public, which uh -huh. I think, again, we've talked about in the past, different approaches and that the British, I think for a long time have had something of a better record of, of kind of talking to, to a public, which is why, you know, they've actually had archeology span TV shows that are not about aliens and Bigfoot. So well, they have a much better ability to not have to deal with the bullshit that we have to deal with just in general. I mean, I mean, well, not, not to be mean or anything, but yeah, they can have a real archeology span show on the air that lasted for like 10 years that people loved and they can also talk about religious things without people losing their shit because they're not a religious country even though we're they talking are. about we're talking about time team folks if you if you don't know what it is because <laughs> many americans don't know it on the other hand i would say of course there's also the colonialism issue and we've talked about how important archaeology is for building identity and this becomes a matter of why people care about the past and and so, issues of colonialism so there's there's that as well but i find it interesting that, that so the creation museum takes this, the same tack as von donnekin very few <laughs> definitive statements but it's just questioning well Could this be they're just this questions section does. this yeah, section nice. does so this section was added later in fact uh, uh james below who wrote about um the creation museum his chapter in our Lost City Found Pyramid book is specifically about the creation of this part of the museum. So it was an add-on. And this mm -hmm. is just my interpretation of having walked through it, but you can feel a definite ethos. Like the main core of the museum is very like it's about it's about like what the why this is, you know, uh, moral issues and scripture and like, oh, because of evolution we've lost our way. The first right. part, which I enjoyed the most was much more von Daniken. It was much more pseudoscience. It was much more, here's a piece of evidence. Could it be true? And it actually doesn't really, like once you get inside the main part, it's actually not like that. Uh -huh. I think it's just probably, I suspect, yeah. I have no knowledge of this. This is just my surface interpretation. I suspect that there was a different sort of philosophy in terms of the creation of this. <laughs> just, it seems, it seems out of place. Uh, and and then this, it's the same with their they have their and I've talked about this before their movie their planetarium stuff also has a different tone not the same tone as this but it's like you can sort of feel which parts were built at different times it's like you know it's like looking uh, at architecture and seeing different right, kinds yeah, of yeah, yeah. architectural styles it's a different style mm -hmm. so and this this um this death of a pterodactyl this is not the only this is probably the best studied and the most clearly resolved of the um, Native American rock art that, that some people interpret as being dinosaurs. The other example that comes to mind is in, um, again in Utah, in Natural Bridges National Monument, um, there's a, it's, a, it's one of the, um, the beautiful uh, places in Utah that have lots and lots of natural arches or natural bridges. And in one that's called Kachina Bridge, there is a, uh, there are petroglyphs there for sure, any of the photographs I've seen of the petroglyphs are, they're very difficult to, to, um, to, to understand, very difficult to see much of anything because they're so highly weathered. But among creationists, they draw, they draw the line between these little patches of, of petroglyph and they draw a brontosaurus. Yeah. So, and that's a really popular theme. The, the Narmer palette, Jeb, you want to tell people why the Narmer palette would be in a in the creation science yeah, museum? Yeah, so the, the Narmer palette is one of, you know what, let's, uh, so this is going to take a little bit of time and we're almost near break. Why don't we pick up with that? Yeah, thank okay, you guys. Great. Let's go to break so, real quick so, and when we come back, we'll absolutely. get the, the Narmer palette. Sure. 
Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We sell the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Are you ready to launch your career to new heights? Visit careers.dish.com slash technician now and uncover a world of exciting opportunities waiting just for you. From cutting edge technology to a supportive work environment, Dish has everything you need to thrive. Don't wait any longer to kickstart your next opportunity. Apply today and join the Dish family where innovation meets opportunity. Visit us online at careers.dish.com slash technician. Your future starts now. And we are back, and we have to Google something before we're allowed to go any further, right, Jeff? In the, in the, in the first third of the show, I, I was searching for the word Piazza, and as soon as I put in Illinois monster painting into Google, uh, I got it. So Piazza is P-I-A-S-A. And there really was an actual pictograph there at some point, <laughs> but – and it sounds like Ken has now seen it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Ken, why is it? Why? Why? why oh my God. Action? Because it looks like it's it's the kind of thing you would see in the back of some junior high school kid's notebook that he's drawing while he's supposed to be paying attention in social studies. Oh, wow. And it's it's just this bizarre. It's just it it screams bullshit. Is his yeah. wing supposed to be the American flag? Is that what's going on? It, actually, look, it looks like stripes, yeah. it looks like flames on a motorcycle. Actually, it does. Today. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, it's. The, the Piazza was a real pictograph, oh, and it no. was re- it was reported, but it got <clears throat> enhanced over yeah. the years, um, and and so I suspect the original didn't quite look like that. And in fact, if you look, there is a depiction from the eighteen from the sixteen hundreds of it um, uh, that is this is in Alton, Illinois. Uh, there's there's a there's a, a French explorer 1678 map that has an image of it and it's cool it's not quite as ridiculous as what's there now but there's an actual mm-hmm. carved marker uh, I when I lived out in Illinois I wanted to go see it. it was one of the few things I wanted to go see while I was out there and I just never found the time to do it but uh, but yeah it's it's pretty damn awesome and that's why I said when you're like oh if you just add a few things this is possibly the worst example I could think of. <laughs> If you add a few things and then people have tried to turn this into a cryptozoological thing. They oh, have so, tried oh, to, okay. well, they've tried to tie it into things like the Jersey devil. They've tried to tie it into things like modern thunderbirds and, and all of that. So this is, this is in that, this is in that wheelhouse, but can, can it's yes, Ken. You know, no, no, I was just going to say that as I'm, I'm looking down my list of, of Google hits, were you also aware Jeb that Alton, where this is located is quote one of the most haunted small towns in america and yes then then there's a whole story about the uh, somehow the 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 piazza bird is tied into hauntings or something well we've talked about we've talked about this before but you know there's the whole uh you the native burial ground haunting thing that's made up made up around 120 130 years ago in many ways and it's the same thing, you know, oh, Amityville, so they were hoaxing the Amityville hoax, and then, well, what are we going to do? Let's put it on an Indian burial ground. Well, we can Absolutely. prove it's not Indian burial ground. Well, let's make it a, a place where they would have brought their mentally ill people, which wouldn't leave right. a, a material record so nobody yeah. can disprove it. You know, just saying. Right. No, it's, right. it's, it's the uh, – and all of these. And, and so that actually gets – cryptozoology loves doing this. Cryptozoology loves – we have this idea for a monster. Well, to, like, situate it – Let's situate it in indigenous folklore because right. it's across a border of a cultural appropriation. In fact, I was talking about that with my students yesterday. We watched um, – we, we're, we're doing a thing with uh, sort of how creation – this is in a col- course called Cultural Art Artifact – how creation happens, how creation of artwork happens. And I had them watch a movie called Everything is a Remix. Uh, that looks at issues of borrowing and copying and transformation. And we watched one where the guy – the documentary maker basically breaks down the matrix, the movie, the matrix, mm-hmm. and it's based on so many. Don't ruin the matrix for me. 
Don't ruin no, the no. first Matrix for me. No, 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 no. I'm not. But it's ba- <laughs> well, maybe maybe slightly. Um, it's based on so many um kung fu movies. It's based on so many yeah. kung fu movies and so many Hong Ku- uh, Hong Kong wire fu movies. And it, you know, and, and and they never said it wasn't. And then the last third of the video is how there are like scene for scene, shot for shots that are taken from the anime Ghost in the Shell. Yes. And they have openly said, when we were selling the movie to Ron Silver, or whoever the producer was, we showed him Ghost in the Shell and said, we want to do this live action in a sense. (laughs) And then I actually showed the trailer for Ghost in the Shell, the live action movie, which kind of looks like The Matrix. Mm -hmm. And we sort of talked about that whole ball of copying and, and adaptation. But the thing I mentioned to my students was, other than in this video where he's where the Wachowskis are clearly fans of Philip K. Dick, because they are, um, is there anything else that unites maybe all of the air influences? And they're like, there's a lot of Asian movies. I'm like, yes, there are a lot of Asian movies. <laughs> and, 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 and we had also watched one with um, Star Wars where the there you know Star Wars is based a lot on Flash Gordon it's also based a lot on Akira Kurosawa mm-hmm. and there's a there's a long history of people sort of a, I don't know if I want to use the word appropriating but going across cultural lines finding something else and taking it back and all of a sudden turning into art I mean very famously Van Gogh who took uh, a lot of influence from uh, Japanese art mm-hmm. and and brought it back to Europe and and Europeans who hadn't seen it, it's like, this is amazing. And I'm sure many people in Japan would have said in, Jap- in Japanese, yes, it was when we created it. <laughs> um, but You're it, right. everybody we does liked that. it so much, we kept it. Yeah, everybody does. Everybody does. That, there's nothing wrong with that. No, yeah. But we're talking about two different phenomena personally here, I think. Um, because on the one hand, we're talking about the creation of art and the furthering of the sharing the shared experience through fiction a narrative artwork that kind of stuff on the other hand we are literally talking about appropriation in order to further an agenda right and, and I think that's the difference I think and, that's and that is a, that's a huge mm-hmm. difference yeah. like if yeah. we could say that with this uh monster this illinois monster that they just kept building on it, because, and they probably are at this point. You know, it's a cultural thing for yeah, that. Now, group, now for I that. think it is exactly yeah. in the beginning. Mm. It maybe wasn't, but at no point I think were they seriously saying we are going to mutilate this petroglyph so that we can claim this land as our own. Were there, they, right. I don't feel like they were doing that. If anything, they were like, let's enhance this petroglyph because we want to see it better. And then, oops, we fucked up. Yeah. And right. now we and have this goofy monster. <laughs> well, and that's yes. what and that's what seems to often happen. So, like Ken's example, the the guy who initially highlights the quote unquote pterodactyl was just high because that was a common. It's a it's a thing I obviously don't right. agree with, but that was a common thing with rock art where mm-hmm. you would outline it with yeah. chalk for photography. And and I right. get that. I don't think you should do that, but no. I understand if I was if I was an archaeologist 100 years ago, I probably would be doing it. So, you know, that's but then somebody sees it and is like, "Ah, this is evidence for the flood. This yeah. is evidence for this." And yeah. that's I think the theme of our of our episode is right, people going and taking something completely outside and then robbing bits and bobs from other folks to kind of prove their thing, which on the surface might be sympathetic because on the surface it might be like, oh, look, I'm taking you seriously at least (laughs) until it's like, well, actually, not really because you want this to be this, but I'm actually turning it into what I really know is the case, which is the flood or uh, a giant ape or the, you know, a plesiosaur that allows me to deny modernity. You know, right. th- that, yeah. that's, that, I find that really actually disrespectful. The initial outlining, I think, was just this guy said, wow, right. this is a cool mythical yes. beast of the Indians that we don't know about. I'm going to help people see it. It's and then unfortunately, he then helped people see it. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then interpret it within their creationist framework. And it, to the point where it now is, it's it's highlighted at the Creation Science Museum. Yep. And I wonder, Jeb, how long will it take the folks at that museum to go back and remove that panel because they're aware, of course, 
that that's been entirely debunked. Well, well given they... that Ken Ham openly is like dinosaurs don't have feathers, and we we're and we're bringing dinosaurs back the way they should be. Uh, uh, the answer is uh, never. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> the only thing I can see coming out of this this cool new technology being applied to this is more of the sea scientists are actively covering up evidence for dinosaurs and that kind of stuff because that's oh, no, what well, they I always can, say. I can see it going a whole other ba bad way where people use it and then abuse it, where they use it to see shit that's not actually there. Right. Right. You know, I mean, where, the two they overdo it. The two. I mean, to kind of bring us to connect the two of these, actually, um, after the uh, X-rays were taken of the the pterodactyl petroglyph, you mentioned that there are two hominid figures, hominid figures that kind of pop out. They're both. Yeah vaguely human looking but they also so that of course means they are bigfoot they're bigfoot. They're, of course they're oh, they bigfoot. could be bigfoot yeah, yeah. which ties that, us that, into that. the other article that we yeah. wanted to discuss um which i adore is called hairy men on rocks or at least that's what hey, i'm calling can, it can we back off like one second because jeb mentioned the narmer palette oh sure oh sure. the narmer palette yeah really don't know what yeah. that is the the narmer palette is one of a number of cosmetic palettes like think literally a thing that you have your your makeup on um from pre-dynastic egypt like late pre-dynastic egypt so as uh you have lots of egyptian little city states and they are uh, fighting and warring and competing, and by around 3100, they've become unified. They start to slowly unify into northern and southern, upper and lower Egypt, and finally unify into Egypt with one of the first. He's no longer his first unified king, or what would later get called pharaoh, uh, but Narmer. And right. these actually have a lot of proto-hieroglyphs on them. We now know there are other objects, but these slate um, stones were early elite goods. The Narmer palette was for a long time. You've probably seen it in your history textbooks. It was often considered one of the first historical documents. We now have better ones, but it, um, it has on both sides. On one side, it's got Narmer like about to like smash a guy with a mace. Mm -hmm. He looks like he's doing a mic drop, but and, like, no, he's got to smash this guy. And there's glyphs all over telling that he's from uh, the city of Neken, Hiram Complus, because there's a falcon and all that. And it has his name on it. You flip it over, it has him marching captives around, and they're, in fact, speaking of appropriation, but there are also these two beasts. They have bodies like panthers, but their necks are all uh, really super long and intertwined. It's actually a Mesopotamian, a Sumerian image, and there are several Sumerian images in Egyptian. Uh, they did borrow from each other, but they're not like dependent on each other. Like Egyptian hieroglyphs emerge around the same time as cuneiform, but they're not remotely related. And so the caption in the Creation Museum is, the Narmer palette contains some of the earliest hieroglyphs ever found, as well as two long neck creatures that resemble sauropod dinosaurs. And I'm like, right. actually, they don't at all. Because one, they're panthers. <laughs> they're friggin' panthers with long necks. And two... I am not a paleontologist or biologist, but if you took a sauropod and did that to its neck, it would be dead. <laughs> right. It would die. These are monsters. And there are plenty of other images of taking parts of one natural creature and parts of another natural creature and messing with that in Sumerian and Egyptian. I mean, my God, the Egyptians are literally the people who are like, oh, by the way, all of our gods, we're going to put animal heads on them. Well, I mean, like, if you just this look, is this is the thing you have an issue with. If you just look at the palette and use that argument, I mean, you've got flashlight fish going on up here at the top. You've got these two human-headed bulls. I oh, guess yeah. they're bulls. Yeah. They've got like ram horns curving in towards so, their yeah. heads. I mean, yeah. why are you just picking out these two long-necked yeah. panthers? You don't, yeah, you don't get to cherry pick what you're going to view as as a, an actual depiction. The cool thing about the Narmer palette, as well, is on on one side. The Narmer is wearing the crown of Lower Egypt, and on the other side, it's the crown right. of Upper Egypt. On, so on, the the side we're, is, on the side we're talking about, he's got the red crown of Lower Egypt, the little curly cue, and on the other side, yeah. he's got the uh, the white crown, the bowling pin of Upper Egypt. And, yeah, the idea here is that this is the first time a king had claimed both, both right. Upper and Lower. We now suspect that's maybe not, but these guys all fall into what's called Dynasty Zero, like right. right you know the sort of the the proto early and then pretty much after him you have the first dynasty in what's called like archaic egypt mm -hmm. yeah. this is really this is why it's so famous yeah. it is it's, it's a an real, amazing it's piece cool. 
I have not seen the original. I believe the original is in the Cairo Museum. I have seen, however, the Battlefield palette, which is basically the same sort of thing. No, they are very, I mean, these would be elite goods. These would be very fame, like expensive elite goods. They're really cool. Yeah, yeah they're so great. Anyway. Yeah, another, crypt, another cryptid that, sometime, that is um, sometimes seen in rock art in the Southwest is occasionally there are Clearly, the animals are being depicted in petroglyphs are big horn sheep, so uh -huh. they have sheep bodies, they have sheep uh -huh. horns, but again, the neck is the neck of a giraffe, gigantically uh -huh. long neck, and you've had people say, well, maybe this means, and and the interpretations vary, but some kind of giraffe-like animal, yeah. which doesn't exist in the New World, was actually being seen by, by people before the flood. Right. And again, there's no specific interpretation other than it's kind of a hallucinatory depiction of a bighorn sheep. Yeah. No. So, so, th so that we wanted to get to Harry Bigfoot. Man, right? Yeah, to yeah. the Harry. Man. All right. So, do you guys want to introduce it? Well, we've yeah. Let's do a let's do a quick intro for this. All right. Well, there are there are a number of sites, especially I guess in California, where rock art there are, there is rock art, genuine rock art that depicts an upright individual, this is a, a, a person standing on their rear, on their, their legs with out, arms outstretched, and that in a couple of cases appear to have long hair. And the most famous of one of these is, is on the Thule Indian Reservation in Southern California, and in fact it's called the Hairy Man Pictograph. Hairy Man is in fact a, 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 a spirit animal, a spirit creature, that is part of the creation story told by the in, by several different Indian tribes. The Yokuts are one of them in yeah. Southern California, yeah. and that so this this hairy man has a is firmly ensconced in their creation story in their in their their um, spiritual description of the world around them. Now, folks who believe that Bigfoot is a real animal have encountered that, and there are a couple of others. I've seen one. Um, that, as far as I know, the the, the creation fo the um, the Bigfoot people haven't seen, which is also in Southern California. It looks very similar to the Hairy Man pictographs in on the the Tule Indian Reservation, um, and the argument there is that in fact these are eyewitness depictions of a real critter, and that real critter is Sasquatch. And, and I'll then say they go uh, ahead, they go ahead. ahead and also look at the the, the bits of the legend of. The hairy man, he he's large, he lives out in the woods, he steals people's food, and that again, that that those are those bits and pieces are taken as my god, that sounds like a perfect description of the real animal we call Sasquatch. Right. And if you haven't seen the image yet, one you 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 should. You should you should take a look at it. Um I I'll, I'll tell you, this thing it, so some rock art, in fact, my students are actually often surprised by rock art. They often think that rock art is going to be um, smaller or not small, going to be like simpler, uh, you know, like more sure. like stick figure -y. And then I show them Chauvet Cave and they're like, my God, that's that's impressive. Right. Or they think it's going to be full of people. They think it's in which which it often isn't. Um, and they think all these things. But if you look at the hairy man, um, this is literally, if you were going to make a movie trailer about people hunting for Bigfoot, this is exactly what it would look like. Right. You know, it's like, it looks like, it's because it's not because it looks like a Sasquatch, because it's sketchy and it's kind of scary looking. Yeah. It's like, spooky. It, you know, it's spooky. Spooky is the word, absolutely. Yeah think, yeah, think of like any any movie like uh made in the last 20 years where there's like some character has drawn like a super sketchy creepy thing that you flash in the trailer it would actually kind of look like this yeah so i think right. i think that helps a lot here right and interestingly right it's there's not just one of them there's ostensibly in in this this um picture cave there are what, there's a family. There's there's a, a, a Mr. Bigfoot, a Mrs. Bigfoot, and see, the kids. See, and this is where my one of my problems with these pictographs pop up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do not like that interpretation, mainly because other than size, there is no reason to interpret that as a quote-unquote family, especially when you look at the surrounding pictographs where you can see they, they don't they don't look the same. They don't look the same, and there's like littler 
kind of stick figure-ish people in the background. It's like, this is obvious to me. This is an obvious interpretation of perspective where big hairy man is obviously the closest one and little hairy man is the furthest away. That's what it looks like to me. I am not a petroglyph expert, but I do not see father, yeah. mother, child. There's nothing on the female figure, the quote unquote female figure, to indicate that it's female. Yeah. Or the, or hairy. Or like, hairy, really. Yeah, right. they don't look hairy to me at all. Like the, are, like, I mean, I'll give you this. Again, the one the one everybody always shows, right. I can see why they were like, <gasps> but the yeah. other ones don't look hairy. No, no. They're not and at also, all the same. The thing too, the thing too, and this is often the case, is that when you see those those photographs of those particular uh, pictographs, they're not pl placed in any kind of context. They're not the only things painted. There are a whole host of other critters that yeah. all can be related yeah. to the the origin story told by these folks. So it's not like like this is this is not a newspaper account of oh my god we saw these <laughs> critters we are now painting them. This is part of an overall an overall depiction of a number of different creatures that are part of their creation story, and you can't you you cannot remove these things from context. It's what it's what happens all the time. It happens in the ancient aliens um, um, uh, pseudoscience. It happens again and again where individual images that are part of a much larger, broader context are removed from that context and say, "See." There's no other way to explain it but this, but when you put it in context, it's like the Palenque sarcophagus lid. Yeah. If you put it in the general, oh, broader context of Maya iconography, it makes perfect sense within that iconography. You don't have to say, well, there's no other explanation. It must be an alien. In this case, again, to say that, well, there's no other explanation, that must be a a a realistic depiction of a Bigfoot ignores all of the other data that's right there in the, um, well, in the, in the various well, art panels. Before and we can, we, we can, hang on, go ahead, go ahead. Before we go any farther on that, let's go to break real quick because I have another comment to make about that exact interpretation thing again. So and I have a, to, I have a, I have a, I have an example we'll bring up too. Okay. So Fantastic. let's go to break real quick. And when we come back, we'll, we'll start tearing this apart. Hosted by archaeologist Emily Long, Trial Tales is an archaeology podcast with stories told by archaeologists about the crazy world of archaeology. Emily weaves a tale of wonder and excitement with her intriguing questions and imaginative editing skills. Check out Trial Tales today at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash trial tales. Now let's get back to the show. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo saucy. Zaxby's. Shop Plato's Closet tax-free August 2nd through 4th for back-to-school styles. We saw the trendy, gently used styles you need to make a difference in the world and in your wallet for back-to-school shopping. Save up to 70% off regular retail prices by choosing recycled styles. Save even more when you shop tax-free this weekend. Make a change that others can respect and repeat. Shop Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley this year for your back-to-school looks. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on rivers avenue and we are back and we were talking about the hairy man petroglyphs and interpretations of the hairy man petroglyphs and here is one of my things that people will have to read the article to completely understand but at one point in the scholarly ar article that was written about these glyphs um the is, this, is this the maya dicta is or whatever let me yeah the maya dicta yeah i found it um you, but the author mentions a part of the creation myth that Ken was mentioning before we went to break, where the creation myth very quickly states that all of the different animals got together and bequeathed a trait to the right. humans. And right. that uh, Hairy Man bequeathed his two-leggedness to humans, and that's why we walk on two legs and not on four. Because well, Coyote wanted us to be four-legged, but, but Hairy Man won the argument or something. Basically, yeah. Yeah. But then at the end of the myth, it's or at the end of the creation myth, as it is written by the author of that article, it states that after all of the animals had created humans, they then drew pictures of themselves. The animals drew pictures of themselves 
on the rock art. And that's why the hairy man rock art and all of the accompanying animal images are on the rock. To me, that says that someone other than the culture group with the creation myth painted those pictoglyphs or pictographs. Which to me means that those could potentially be older than the culture that's interpreting them. Well, the, the so so the, by the way, I, I misspoke earlier. This is uh, Mayak Dot Tot, the Hairy Man Pictographs by Kathy Mauskett Strain, and it's you can find it in a ton of places online. Right. Um, it's published in one place, the Relic Hominid Hominoid Inquiry, which I believe is Jeff Meldrum's journal on basically Bigfoot. I mean, not, I mean, he would say it's more than that, but it's called the relic hominoid inquiry. I really <laughs> don't have anything else to say about that. Um, and you can also find a version of something similar, Mayak Dot Ta, an archaeological viewpoint of the hairy man pictographs by Kathy Maskowitz, based off a 2003 presentation on bigfootproject.org. You can find this all over the place. And the reason um, that I am citing them as a scholarly article is, A, they're written that way, because obviously she's been trained to write in a scholarly fashion. She, she, has, a, she has a master's in archaeology. She has a I master's. Believe her, I believe her master's was studying this. It's true. I mean, I'm not going to... I'm not knocking I'm just a saying, credential, I'm just, I'm but just, I'm yeah, just putting no. that out. I'm just saying that that's 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 who she is. Yeah, she, she, she's a cryptogeologist. She works for the U.S. Forest Service. I mean, she's got she's got she's the creds. She's an archaeologist. She's an she's archaeologist. An she's got the creds mm -hmm. to be called that. This is written as if it is a true scholarly article. I I mean, beyond that, take take it how you want to take it. But the author does present these the creation myth in her article as. The tail end of it does suggest that yeah. these pictographs existed before the people who are interpreting them as their creation myth, which means well, she she argues she argues that other people have stylistically dated it to be about fifteen hundred to maybe eight hundred years old. So I mean, anybody talking about it in the nineteenth or twentieth century, it would in essence be really old. I mean that that's right. that's yeah. fair. That's I mean that's this is one of these things. Like I sometimes hear people talk about. You know, and sometimes being, and, and I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm just, this is kind of allowing me to say a thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you sometimes have people who are not super high on sort of indigenous archaeology or indigenous knowledge that regards archaeology in, um, in, in the new world. And I'm like, you need to go study how archaeology has been done in the old world. Because it's actually a lot more like what you're criticizing than you might know. Right. And so I think, that, wow, that is, we're just going to wait that out. Yeah, it's I, the it's my the, um, garbage pickup with ah, automated garbage right outside my window right well it there. sounded vaguely pleasant it sounded kind of for and, a minute and, there yeah we're gonna keep this because i was like is 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 ken being abducted by angels is that <laughs> no, no it's, it's like oh <laughs> see from from here it sounded more like the distant wail of uh, of a Bigfoot off in the you know looking for a mate. Well, I'll say in reading in reading the article, they talk about how you're not so, or maybe some That's of the other true. stuff I've been reading. Her giants, Campbell's monsters. If you go looking for and disturb the hairy man, he comes after you. Yeah, and, oh, yeah. and he is followed again. by the sound Just of saying. bells and high whistles. Oh God! Yeah. You didn't now, know that. I have to walk home in the dark, people. Don't do this to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway. Uh, all right. Anyway. The, the point I was trying to make is, uh, as we were, had been talking much earlier in the podcast about the reinterpretation, the, the cultural reinterpretation of older images, it sounds like that might be what's occurring here, is we've got these older images of these, they don't even look like hairy people, I'm sorry, of these human-looking well, the figures. I think the big one does. Yeah. <sighs> I'll give you, I, I don't think so. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but they're reinterpreting them to fit their creation myths, which is fine. Because we really have no real way of ever figuring out right. otherwise. Yeah, um, you very often have these layered interpretations. Exactly, of art, exactly. Which, sure. Uh, sure. You, you, you can't go back a thousand years and ask people, oh, what is? what do you mean by that? Exactly. So you have, very often they are, in fact, the descendants of the folks who produce that art. And these things are going to they're, they're, there's going to be syncretism. There's going to be all kinds of stuff. The story is going to evolve. Those stories, and that's, yeah, that's just and that is part of and that is part of their reality and story. And that's legitimate. That's all legitimate. Yeah, Absolutely. and it's like so is there something similar with the the Mayan and the Aztec peoples? Wasn't don't they have a culture before their culture? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is something I write about a lot, where like mm. I talk about how people saw. It. I mean, this is my extra humans idea, where you find things and you're like, who made this? But yeah, they they talk about the previous people, and and thing is, is intriguingly, sometimes you can in fact see very much kind of cool, insightful that resonate with later discoveries by scientific uh-huh. archaeology i mean you can see shadows of it i mean mm. i don't I, I it should not be dismissed but it should also be taken in that context and i don't feel yeah. like the author was doing that when they wrote down that creation myth or when they started trying to basically argue that these are images of bigfoot well i think that also gets to what bigfoot is so uh, i I'm I'm going to try to be very charitable right now. Yes, uh, <laughs> we've done. We've waited until the very end of the podcast. To, we will uh, be charitable set, about set this. Jeb, yes, because because this is a thing. So like Robert Unleash Muckle. The gem. Sorry, Ro, Ro, Robert Muckle has written about this, and he's written about in a couple of different places. Like I think Anthropology News and a few others, Archaeology and Bigfoot, Anthropology and Bigfoot, where he's like, look, don't just laugh at this because. Both indigenous and non-indigenous people really do believe in these things in various ways. And for many indigenous people, this is not just like a ape or something like that, but it's it's a it's a spirit being, it's an important thing. And you should take that into some consideration. It doesn't mean you have to believe this or that, but maybe you should take that into consideration. And while I, I suspect some of our audience might not actually like that. Uh, Because we do, you know, from like the really hardcore skeptic side, I can at least see that where I think it bothers. And and I know a lot of people who do believe in a spiritual context also like when people who look at it from a non-spiritual context basically say it's a giant, it's a gigantopithecus. It's a it's a paranthropus. They some do find that. But for me, honestly, that that actually is weird. That's this. I guess what I'm saying is, so some, in fact, a lot of people in like the Bigfoot community talk about these being ultra dimensional. Some people believe they're demons. I really wish I was making that up, but I'm not. But they talk about being extra dimensional or psychic. But of course, the main kind of meaning in Western culture of Bigfoot is a gigantopithecus, an ape man, uh, maybe like a quote unquote caveman, something like that, but a, a primitive ape-like hominoid, hominin. Something a like that. Corporeal being, an actual, yeah. an actual animal, and one that is in essence animal-like. Although a lot of Western depictions of Sasquatch also do have it being very Sasquatch. By the way, being a word uh, conglomerated out of or, or created out of many different indigenous names by a Westerner, actually by uh, I have it right here in the book Abominable Science: Origins of the Yeti and Other Famous Cryptids by Daniel Loxton and Donald Prothero by a uh, teacher, by a Western teacher, John W. Burns, who collected a bunch of these as folklore and then kind of created the word Sasquatch out of numerous other words. It's an, it's an anglicization, in other words. I just, would, that's something that would, people often don't know. It would be great if it was an acronym. No, it, it is <laughs> not. I mean, it's, yes. it's based on words like bookwees and sisquit and these other words. Um, so, I mean, that, that's fair. That's fair. Um, but... Uh, the the thing is, is that the the Western interpretation of Sasquatch is usually basically ape man is caveman, and right, of course yeah. this clearly starts to become a real thing in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century. Uh, Brian Regal, who's written the book um, Searching for Sasquatch: Crackpots, Eggheads, and Cryptozoology, a fantastic uh, book, and he's been on Monster Talk I think more times than anybody else actually. The podcast that we've been on talking about this, I really highly recommend it. Um, it, he, he, uh, he very much ties us into issues of evolution. In fact, he kind of, in an article argues that Bigfoot killed the werewolf, which by the way, also is a movie in case anybody's looking, it's, it's not, but I'm saying I'll sell you the script, oh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. but, uh, but no, that Bigfoot in essence kills off the concept of the wild man werewolf because after Darwin and, and, and sort of evolutionary theory, all of a sudden Western fixation goes to apes. And in fact, before Sasquatch reports really start to become a thing in the early 20th century, you see lots of reports of apes, not ape men, but apes in like Eastern North America, places like Long Island and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But the, the point is, is that Westerners really see this as this corporeal ape man type thing. And I'm like, so wait a minute. 
you are on the one wanting to say, oh, I'm totally down with indigenous knowledge about right. this, which makes it a creator spirit, but actually it's a North American wood ape. Right. That's, that's messed up. That's actually kind of, that's actually sort of a messed up perspective of like, I'm totally using this until I want to turn it into my thing. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's an appropriate, it, ab it absolutely is an appropriation that makes it sound like, Hey, we're down with the native people. You know, we're on they, them, them and us yeah. on the same side. Yeah. And then they completely recast what the yeah. meaning. No, we're totally, is. we're totally down with the native people, except they're wrong. It's not a creator God. It's an ape. <laughs> but, and you know, this is something, you know, this, this book I'm reading, this hop, that exact scenario happens in the book I'm reading. Um, we may or may not talk about it on a later episode, but there's uh, apparently this petroleum. There were apparently oil fields in Pennsylvania that were being used all the way back in the prehistoric and, and the Paleolithic, which is fascinating to know. And the person who writes the article is, of course, claiming that Bronze Age oil barons were coming over from the Mediterranean to take the oil back to the Mediterranean to make Greek fire, but uh... neither here nor there. <laughs> The point is, is that in the article, he spends a lot of time building the idea that Native Americans were using the, the, the oil themselves, like proving it through historical documentation and archaeology that Native Americans were using the oil. So it's kind of like, oh, yeah, Native Americans, totally. They're so cool. Look at them using this oil. And then it's like, but really, it was Bronze Age uh, Mediterranean yeah. sailors who were using it. And, you know. And, and any of the Native Americans you talk to would totally agree with me because they said that yeah. there were boats once. And it's yeah. just well, like, there's, there's, crypt, it's I mean, cre creationists do this all the time. I mean, they they went to they, you know there's there's a team that keeps going to Indonesia to investigate the quote unquote ropin, right. which is like this luminescent and it's a spirit, but they're like actually it's a pterodactyl because same reasons we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you it's guys, it's it's just it's, it's just, it is an appropriation to prove another point. Right. Have you guys all seen the, the, the fake photograph of – it looks like Civil War soldiers who have well, killed the pterodactyl? That is all in the Creation Museum. They actually have a it whole is. they have a oh whole exhibit. So this is a fascinating case study in exactly what we're talking about. There is this legend in cryptozoology that somebody in the 20th century saw this picture of right. – cowboys or soldiers with, posing because they had killed a pterodactyl yes. and 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 like lauren coleman's written a lot about this uh, and where nobody can find the original picture but everybody remembers seeing it <laughs> everybody remembers mm -hmm. seeing it and they can never produce it. and now there are dozens of hoaxes around it in fact there was a show i can't remember what it was called it has some really awful like wasn't like WikiLeaks, but it actually sounded like that, like Freaky Links. I think that's what it was called. Made by the people. <laughs> it was made by the people that made the Blair Witch Project. Like they they did a TV oh, show, okay. and actually one of the episodes was about this. And there's a prop that's used for that, and I think it's either it or a photo of it's in in Coleman's Cryptozoology Museum, International Cryptozoology Museum. Uh, but yeah, it's it's actually a very famous story. And I am looking at the Creationist Museum exhibit called Cowboys and Dragons. I can only assume the movie Cowboys and Aliens had come out recently. Um, on April 26, 1890, the Tombstone Epitaph newspaper printed the following incredible report found in the desert. Is it all just another tall tale? So they're actually blending in that and the, the whole thing with the photo. Right. But that photo, there are numerous replications of it all over the Internet. Mm -hmm. So – it is so. This is even like farther removed. The photo is a it's a crypto photo, <laughs> yes. like it doesn't even exist. Well, and if you I Google it, you get these other pictures. There's several yeah. pic several variations of Civil right. War soldiers posing with what it appears to be a dead pterodactyl. But there's also one with a tri with a triceratops. There's one with some elephants in the background. There's one with a giant black bird. It, it becomes very meta. And know, there's like four different of the parodies. Well, and there's like four different soldiers with dead pterodactyl pictures. Some of them yeah. more realistic looking than others, but they're all obviously fake. Yeah, I like I like the one where he's re where you can actually see the whole pterodactyl is spread out. The one where it's kind of on the ground. Yeah, where it's kind of laying I don't down. Think whoever fabricated that one didn't do a very good job of it. Yeah. But these, but these all fall into this, into the same. It, it, it becomes almost a disrespect. It is actually disrespectful to the source material. Remember, remember, there was that fad a few years ago of 
uh, people seeing time travelers in photos. Yes. Um, where they would see somebody with like sunglasses or like a haircut that looks like a punk haircut or something in an old photo. And they're like, is it a time travel? Or that's, this is woman holding a cell phone. I'm like, no, you're an idiot. Like you're just ignorant. This is, there were these, all these things that you're seeing existed and it, it falls into the possibly the thing. If you had to ask me a thing I hate the most on this world. <laughs> Okay, there's a list, but the Mandela effect would be way at the top of that list. Have we talked about this? I don't think so. Oh, God. So there are people, and by people, I'm using that term very loosely, on on the Internet that talk about how the, what they call the Mandela effect. Because they remember Nelson Mandela dying in prison in, like, 1990, which, of course, he didn't. He went on to become right. president of South Africa, and then he died, you know, a few years ago. Um, so they're like, were we in an alternate reality slip? You, you know, am I detecting a different world where he did? I'm like, or you don't remember right. And you're too much of a jackass to admit it. They're also the same thing with the Berenstein bears where they remember Berenstein and it's spelled differently. Like this was spelled differently when I was a child. And I'm like, I hate all of you. I hate <laughs> all of you. Um, but it's that same kind of a miss like whether it's taking indigenous stuff and saying, oh, I'm going to pull this thing out for my fantasy. Or, um, oh, look at this photo. It's got Nicolas Cage the vampire in it. It's like, or the, he's a human. Or there's a human <laughs> that looks like another human because they can only vary so much, you jackass. Um, and and it's, it's just rude. It's just really disrespectful. Yeah. To whether it's to data, to other people, to evidence, you know, Ugh. Yes, but it, it is it is a really obnoxious part of this is the uh, these these folks who want to see Bigfoot as a real creature and they try to kind of piggyback their claim on the on the the spiritual beliefs of Native Americans and that's what it amounts to. Yeah, it's like okay, they agree with us, so therefore, but they don't, but they do, but they don't, and therefore. Hey, listen, we're on we're on the good side. We're on we're on God's side here because we are supporting a Native American um, spiritual belief. But like you said, Jeb, but but actually, it's not a creator god. It's a it's a giant ape. Yeah, because that's not disrespectful at all. Your God's an ape, <laughs> yes. right? Exactly. Yeah. But you're well, still you wrong. Go. You're still wrong. But I'm going to patronize you and make you think that you're not. Yeah. No, that's a whole. That's a. Uh, right. Yeah. I. I, I just. Yeah. Back back in the day when I was in college, Firesign Theater was a very, very popular comedy troupe. And one of the bits they did is kind of along those lines where it has has one of them as kind of a hippie talking to a Native American. And of course he's <laughs> saying, you know, dude, I, I really can get down with you Native American. You really have this great spirituality about you. You really got fucked over. Oh, and by the way, do you have any peyote? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so no, it's I, like exactly. they're, look, they're looking exactly. for something there. No, that, right. that is, I, I think that's a really good way of putting it. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, we are closing in on time. Final thoughts, mm -hmm. Ken? Uh, no, this, this, was, this was awesome. Let us, let us all hope that when we see Native American rock art that we appreciate it and accept it for what it is. It, 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 these are the artistic depictions by Native people of the, their, their dreams, their intuition, their, their creativity – and that accept them on those terms and don't impose whatever perspective you have. Don't impose your perspective. You're a cryptozoologist or an ancient alien fan or in one recent case, this guy thinks that ancient – that American Indians had microscopes because they're depicting microorganisms. It's disrespectful to impose that exterior view on somebody else's culture. Let's look, look at this stuff and appreciate it for what it is and not impose our perceptions yeah. On what we want it to be. Yeah. You know, my my final thought, honestly, just if you're gonna write fiction, just get better <laughs> at it and stop lying about it by saying it's true. Cause but, God. But it makes the world right, so exactly. much more interesting when yes. I say it's true. Yeah, except <laughs> it doesn't because you then just have warmed over crap. Uh yeah. This this actually this one actually bothers me a bit. Like it really annoys annoys me on some it's like you're it, it I don't know. 
It just it, bothers me on no, some level. Right. I mean, it's appropriation. It, it the, is the appropriate. Line, yeah. The word that you try, you were going to avoid before, but used is absolutely the right word. It's yeah. appropriation. Yeah. I mean, it or, should. Which could also be called theft, but we can go back there yeah. at some other time. It it should disturb us, and I mean, it obviously it's going to disturb the anthropologists and the archaeologists more than it's going to disturb the common man because you know we. We have been trained to see this. We feel it more deeply. I'm not dismissing people who don't. I'm just saying, if you hear Ken and Jeb and I going on about appropriation and why this particular thing bothers us on this visceral level, that's why. But do keep in mind that any time that you're reinterpreting another culture's culture for your own benefit, you are appropriating their culture for your own benefit. Um and that's exactly. my final thought on the matter. Let's not draw on petroglyphs with chalk, and let's just accept things. Yeah, the for the love of God, don't don't, yeah, do, don't that do that either. That's that's just don't, that's just, that's don't just enhance things. Just leave them the way they are. <laughs> the the one really decent piece of rock art we have here in New England is Bellows Falls in Vermont. And oh back yeah. In the nineteen tens, nineteen twenties, somebody took yellow paint Aww. and and painted. In first, they painted within the the actual petroglyph, and then painted broad yellow swaths above them. So in case you couldn't find the petroglyphs, you could just look yeah. at the. Yeah. No, I've I've, just, I've been I've awful. been there. Yeah, uh, I've been there, and of course they look like they have antennae because of course they do. Right. Yeah. Right. Because uh, they do yeah. now. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. Fantastic, guys. Yep. Well, talk to you soon. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye. No, we don't do a dinosaur. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed it. Our music was provided by Archeosuit Productions. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Stitcher and share us wherever you use social media. You can contact us with your questions, comments, or angry email at archiefantasies at gmail.com. You can follow the podcast at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash archiefantasies. You can follow the blog at www.archiefantasies.com and get updates on Tumblr and Twitter at Archiefantasies. You can also look for us on Facebook. If you're looking for the show notes for this episode, go to the podcast website at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash Archiefantasies. Thanks again for listening. No, we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. We don't do dinosaurs! This show is produced by Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle. And edited by Chris Sims. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Ready to level up your career? Text DISH to 44043 now to dive into a world of exciting technician opportunities at DISH. From cutting-edge technology to a supportive work environment, DISH offers the perfect platform for your success. Connect with us today to discover how you can be part of a dynamic team driving innovation. Connect today and join the DISH family, where innovation meets opportunity. Text DISH to 44043 to kickstart your journey towards a rewarding career.